हे टीम वेलकम टू माई सेशन ऑन कॉफी विद प्रब एंड टुडे वी गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट सम कॉफी शॉट विच इज मैप्ड विद द डोमेन फॉर ओ सी आई एस पी आई कैन से वन थिंग दिस दिस इज अ फर्स्ट काइंड ऑफ अ वीडियो विच इज अपलोड ऑन यूट्यूब विच कवर द मेजर टेक्निकल एस्पेक्ट ऑफ द डोमेन फोर एंड आफ्टर कंक्लूडिंग ऑफ दिस वीडियो और आफ्टर कमीशन ऑफ दिस वीडियो यू विल गेट अ बेटर विजिबिलिटी अबाउट द डोमेन फोर टॉपिक आई एम श्योर दैट If you're new to the channel do subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the bell icon to make sure you should not miss my future videos on a similar topic so and for more information if you want to know more about me please do check my LinkedIn profile so without wasting a time let's start with the first part thank you Okay so first coffee shot which type of routing protocol handles routing between routers within an enterprise no question talking about routing protocol see when you talking about protocol so we have a two type of protocol one is basically called as routing protocol i'm talking about a specific protocol works on the network layer of osi model so we have a two type of protocol one is called routing protocol and one is basically called as a routed protocol so routing protocol is the one which basically define the route you can say like that and routed protocol is basically carry data on that route so routing protocol like rip ospf igrp these are basically routing protocol and routed protocol examples are ipx okay then we have a uh, ipx is there ip is there so these are routed protocol so three things you need to understand from this question router is a device works on the network layer of the osi model routing is basically routed routing is basically work on the network layer now question saying that which type of routing protocol handle routing between the routers within within an enterprise i'm not talking about two different enterprise i'm talking about within an enterprise so option a igp word itself say interior gateway routing protocol so that is a protocol work within a one autonomous system EGP was basically the historical it's a obsolete protocol that was used to connect two different autonomous systems so we have a autonomous system 1 and we have a autonomous system 2 and it is a distance vector routing protocol okay but IGP sorry interior gateway routing protocol work within that okay so EGP is basically work between the two autonomous system PGP is not a routing protocol PGP is basically used for email encryption and bgp is called as a backbone of internet today so if you got any question on the exam talking about backbone the core part the answer is basically bgp today bgp is the backbone of internet and bgp is a standard protocol which is used for routing between the different autonomous system on the internet and it is why it is called as a path vector protocol path vector it is basically called as a path vector okay protocol which is part of a tcp ip suite and it support the complex topology and also handle routing decision based on the path and it is highly scalable also and it can also manage the network route so bgp removed and egp removed so only option is basically left is yeah yeah tell me so answer is a for alpha okay because a is basically the protocol which is work within the enterprise if the question say between two scalable then answer is basically bgp border gateway protocol so let's move to the next question or next coffee shot thank you another interesting question which type of routing protocol handle the route the keyword is basically here they talking about route traffic between two separate organization they are not talking about uh, you know within the organization they talking about two separate okay so that is a keyword route traffic between the two separate organization so option a igp interior gateway but that work within the uh, autonomous system bgp work between the two enterprise that's why it is also backbone pgp is for email security for email security we basically use pgp now we left with rip rip basically stand for routing information protocol it is basically a comp it's not a complex protocol but it is used to distribute routing information within the autonomous system actually within the autonomous system and uh, when you're talking about this uh, this protocol basically support up to 16 hops 
okay after that it can be reachable so it has a two version rip one and rip two so initial version doesn't support proper subnetting and all that but version two basically support all the classless inter-domain routing cidr which called and also include the subnet mask for each root entry so it introduced more robust security so that is the reason so if the question is specifically talking about two separate organizations so answer is basically yes so answer is bgp because bgp used to connect two different enterprise okay so let's move to the next question thank you so another interesting question the question says an organization shift their business model to keep up with the technologically evolving world the networks continue to grow more complex with the influx of new device devices with employees working remotely from personal computer or accessing the corporate network from personal phone some solution must also be able to handle permission and authentication of unfamiliar devices attempt to access the network which solution will you recommend to manage these devices okay so intent of the question is we have a multiple devices who are trying to connect with the network and now you are looking you know there is a concern is also there that okay there was a permissions are coming authentication of unfamiliar devices are coming so which solution will you recommend in that case so the first option is basically called as a NAC now let's understand what is NAC here okay problem of the question is they're talking about the concern challenge and everything you know multiple device trying to connect there's no concern so we're looking for a solution to streamline the process okay so the first option is basically called as a NAC. So what is NAC here? See, what happened is this is your enterprise. Let's take an example. Okay, hypothetical scenario. This is your enterprise, okay? Every day, thousands of users are basically coming to the enterprise and they're carrying their own devices. Okay, some users are there. And along with that, employees also carrying their laptop. So we want to ensure all the devices, whether it is a user who carry the devices or the employees who carry the devices should have a basic configuration with all the adequate security settings. So when any device come to the organization and trying to connect, their request is goes to the DHCP server first. But DHCP will not assign the IP. DHCP will basically send the request to NAC. The solution is basically called as a NAC. It is same like you know, when you resume back office after COVID, the minimum criteria was you need to you need to submit your vaccination certificate, which is your health status. Health. That is a minimum baseline of health status. Same like your system is configured with antivirus, have all the patch and everything. That is also called as a health check. So when any device trying to connect, NAC will basically scan the system and check the adequate security settings. If they have adequate security settings, it will be part of a corporate network. If not, it will move to the restricted networks. So by this way, when we having a dynamic situations with a multiple device trying to get the IP from the DHCP and you want to control the security setting and you want to ensure only authorized and approved health check device will be part of a network. There we use NAC. So today NAC is used in an enterprise. In Microsoft, we call this as a NPS. Option B basically talk about the NAD. There's a network, no, there's network access discovery. So it's a, just a tool to discover how many devices we have. Firewall is basically filter on the network level. It doesn't filter on the application level. We have that, but it will not be going to investigate all the authentications and everything. So it is something installed on the border of the network and DHCP basically assign the IP. So according to that standard, because question says, organization shift the business model to keep up the technologically evolving world grow more complex with the influx of a new devices so first problem statement is basically new devices okay the first problem statement is new devices and with employee working remotely from personal computer or accessing the corporate network from personal phones some solutions must not able to handle the permission authentication of unfamiliar device which is basically might be against my benchmark who trying to access the network so which solution will you recommend to manage these devices so that is the reason answer is exactly so answer is basically a for alpha network access control because by this way we can able to ensure only authorized device to be part of the network let's move to the next coffee shot thank you another interesting question the question is uh, which layer of osi responsible for establishing a communication between nodes and defining a rule of a session rule of a session 
So option A, application layer. Application layer is basically the one which interact with the user. Okay, it doesn't help you to establish the node. So A removed because from there you initiate the connection. Normally when you open a browser, when you open any app, you're browsing things. So you're actually interacting on the application layer. But the question say responsible for establishing a communication between nodes, not even an application nodes. Okay, option B, network layer, which makes sense. Okay, but network layer receive the data from transport layer. It is a transport layer who divide the data into segment. So this is my transport layer, which is a source. And this is the transport layer, which is a destination. So we divide the data into segment and we assign the sequence number to each segment. One, two, three, four, five. And each segmented data is go through this to reach the destination. So destination use a sequence number to rearrange the data. Okay, so when you're sending a four data, we need to make sure they receive all the four data. So fifth, we get acknowledgement from there. So flow control between the devices is the responsibility of the transport layer. Okay, so network layer. So when transport layer send the each segmented data on the transport layer, transport layer, sorry, network layer. So each segment data, when it come from transport layer to the network layer, each network layer use the segmented and along with that, he add the source IP and destination IP. Source IP and destination IP. One thing you need to understand, it is a transport layer who handle connectionless and connection oriented protocol, but the network layer protocols are connectionless. So it, it cannot help you to establish the session. So that's the reason network layer is eliminated. Transport layer makes sense. Session layer is basically used to establish the session between two applications. Okay. So that is also gone. So only option left is basically exactly. So answer is basically C for Charlie. Because transport layer is the one which coordinated the destination transport layer, ensure the flow controls and ensure the packet will receive in a particular sequence. That is the reason answer is basically C. Second question is basically talking about which layer of TCP IP model converts bits into communication. Definitely not an application layer. Question talking about TCP IP, please don't do mistake in the real exam. If the question talking about TCP IP model, it means it is not talking about OSI, it's talking about TCP IP model. TCP IP model basically have a four layers. The first layer is application layer. Okay, which is a combination of application, presentation and session of OSI. Then we have a internet layer, which is like a network layer of OSI. Then we have a, uh, no, one, first we have a, this called a transport layer. Okay, then we have a internet layer and then we have a network access layer. Network access layer of TCP IP is a combination of physical and data link layer. Okay, physical and data link layer. So, Question says, which layer of TCP I model convert bits into communication? So application layer is the where we initiate. So this is removed. Internet layer is defined the packets. So this is removed. There's nothing called as a physical layer, which is part of a network access layer. That is the reason answer is basically D for Delta. Exactly. So answer is basically D for Delta. So let's move to the next question. Thank you. So another interesting question, and it is a question based on the new syllabus of CISSP. IT director at research institution engage in advanced scientific computation. You are tasked with upgrading your network infrastructure to support intensive data processing requirement. Which network technology is best suited to meet the demands of high performance computing environment where the rapid data processing and efficient data handling is basically are crucial. So here the keyword is processing here and efficient data handling. Okay, so that's something is part of a requirement. Okay, so question talking about they want to upgrade, they want a computations, they want to, uh, for the computation, they want to upgrade their network infrastructure. Okay, why? Because they want to support the data processing. That is a problem statement. So they want a data processing requirement. And they're saying that which network topology which network technology is best, best suited to meet the demand of high performance computing environment where the rapid data processing and efficient data handling are crucial. Again, they're talking about problems when they want a data processing and data handling. Now, first is InfiniBand. See, InfiniBand recognized as a low latency and high throughput capability, which is essential for all the high performance computing applications. You can see, and that work within the servers. Example, we have a server one, we have a server two, we have a server three. So they're they are basically connected together and they basically process the information. Okay. Second is basically called as a Ethernet. Ethernet is basically mean 
uh, the standard we are using for technology but due to the widespread adoption and capability to support the high capacity data transfer with evolving speed enhancement third is basically called as a fiber channel fiber channel is known for its high speed data transfer rate and also dependability in the network storage application mostly used in a san and all that d is a wireless lan simple it is like a simple concept of using the implementation part of wireless function now question is what is the right answer as we talking about the problem statement and want to process the information the answer is basically infinity band exactly and infinity band is basically part of a new syllabus i will tell you why see infinite band is correct because it specifically tailor for a environment that demand ultra low latency and maximum throughput okay i repeat again infinity band is basically used in that case when we talking about your ultra low latency okay and and uh, Uh, and maximum throughput rate which basically making ideal for supporting a strange requirement of high performance computing but if you see the ethernet ethernet offer a versatility and also improving a performance metrics and it generally does not provide the same level of specialized performance in latency and throughput as a infinity band okay it is especially in the high demanding computation scenarios so third is basically called fiber channel fiber channel excel in scenarios which is focus on high speed storage so within a storage you want to process the information for that the network is there and also very expensive it is ideally good for a it is optimal choice for general high performance data processing network data processing network but within a system we want to process data not a wise choice lan is basically offer the practical installation and you can say advantage but lack the robust performance characteristics so that is the reason answer is basically a for alpha so without snacks my coffees are basically nothing so let's discuss about the summary part because when we talking about the summary part com- cost and complexity is the first factor so when you implementing the infini band okay it can be more complex and cost compared to ethernet due to the specialized equipment expertise required and infini band hardware and management tool are also more expensive actually second is it is highly scalable because it can be used within hpc for data center environment and it may not offer the same level of flexibility as ethernet which is almost ubiquitous and support by vast range of hardware so any question in the exam talking about hpc and you want a parameter to be used within a hpc for high data processing and all that answer is basically infini band okay so what is the primary benefit of infini band so that is also a good question so infini band primary benefit is it basically support over the ethernet and cxl cxl we have to discuss in next slide which is called as a compute express link okay it is exceptionally low latency and high throughput and infini band is designed specifically for the high performance computing environment where these factors are critical so any question specifically talking about high performance computing within a server so and that is critical and availability is a fa- factor so we basically go for the hpc infini band is commonly used in a scientific research where the massive computational task is there so any scenario based question talking about massive computational task what kind of a technology you support there we basically use the infini band okay remember that so that is the most important part so let's move to the next coffee shot thank you so in the previous section we discuss about infini band another new topic which is basically there in the syllabus which is called as a compute express link thin line differences when you're talking about infini band used within the servers and all that cxl used to connect the servers multiple servers so question is talking about as a cto at data intensive ai research facility you are tasked with upgrading the server infrastructure to meet the demand of increasingly complex computational task which technology is specifically designed to improve the efficiency of connection between the cpus okay cpus and high speed peripheral supporting the rapid processing requirement of your facility so three keywords are there the first keyword let me uh, increase the font so first keyword is basically connection between the cpu now the document connection between the cpus so we have a one server we have a cpus so we want a connection between the cpus or we have a multiple servers and you want a connection between that cpus okay connection between the sp- cpus and high speed peripheral so the previous one was the component used within a server but now they talking about the connection between the cpus understood so option a basically compute express link it is basically enhance the server performance 
by facilitating more efficient communication between the CPUs and various peripheral to support the microprocessor. Second is basically called as a peripheral component interconnect express. See peripheral component interconnect express is utilized for connecting a diverse range of component at a high speed. DMA basically stand for direct memory access which allow peripheral to access system memory directly. Okay, bypassing a CPU does not make sense. Option is InfiniBand. It is a basically providing a throughput and low latency in data center and computing environment. So the close answer is basically here is a for alpha. So there is always a confusion between what is the thin line difference between the uh, CXL and uh, your InfiniBand. So I will tell you one thing. InfiniBand is focused on the network and storage connectivity you know with high performance and mainly in specializing a field required the significant data throughput and minimal latency in contrast cxl is designed to enable the high speed efficient interconnectivity i repeat interconnectivity between the processors and various type of high speed device or the memory expansion so we have a systems here okay connectivity between that is infinity band but within a server we have a cpus between that the connectivity is basically required in cxl Okay, so that is the first important thing you need to understand. Another important thing is that interconnect type. So InfiniBand is a standalone network topology where the CXL build upon and extend the capability of the PCS. So you can say Infinity Band was old and CXL is basically the new one. And InfiniBand is more common scenario where the entire network need to be optimized for performance like cluster and supercomputer and CXL use within a server or between close coupled server to expand enhance the memory and device cohesivity and performance so both technology crucial so it's up to us and directly providing the availability and if you ask me about the application so it primary use of a uh, this called uh, infini band is for the high band with low latency like hpc financial services you know this is your uh, stock market and all that they want to process data more faster there we basically use the cxl and if you see the ideal application for the sorry that was basically for the infinity band and for the cxl it is ideal for the data center where accelerators such as gpu fgpas and other advanced technologies need to be closely integrated with the cpu that is a thing okay so let's move to the next coffee shot thank you hold on hold on without snacks how it is possible so cxl ideal for the data center looking to expand or looking to scale up the resources okay Keyword is scale memory and improve the performance. So if the question talking about scale of the memory connecting with the processor answer is CXL connecting a storage connecting a server to optimize a network 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 then answer is basically infinity band. How to remember band is basically used in the network. So this is how you can remember CXL is suitable for the workload in a AI CXL infinity band should be based on the scientific requirement of memory throughput latency. CXL is emerging as a strong contender in the server based environment require high speed coherent interconnect and infinity band continue to be a top choice for the traditional HPC environment for the maximum data transfer. Okay, so let's move to the next coffee shot. Thank you. Okay, next coffee shot a network architect at multinational corporation is tasked with redesigning the company extensive network infrastructure to overcome the scalability and limitation posed by the traditional VLAN. So here the problem statement look like a uh, traditional VLAN. So primary challenge involve the need for a more scalable method to segment network traffic across a numerous department and geographical location. So they have a problem statement is challenge involve the scalable method okay which of the following solution address this challenge by providing a greater scalability in the network segmentation compared to vlan so it means they're using a vlan already option a mpls see mpls actually utilize the label switch path so mpls is not for the segmentation question talking about segmentation and scalability now mpls is a van technology which forward the database on a label how let me explain you that so let's say example we have a system a here and here we have a system b okay so this is basically called as a mpls cloud before we discuss about the mpls cloud let me explain you one layman example so what happened is 15 years 15 years back when we don't have a google map so how we basically go from source to destination 
So we basically start a car. At one point when we have a T point, we ask some people, okay, we have to go this location. Can you just tell us? Then he will say go right. Then we take again. Then there is another T point. Then we ask. So every time we ask multiple people and then we reach, which is basically slow down the process. But today we have a path which is very clear. We follow the Google map exactly and according to the path, we reach the destination. So we have a fastest way to send the data. So what happened is suppose A is basically using a technology which is called X.25. It's a one band technology and B is basically using a frame relay. Okay. So here we have one router which is basically called as a LER, label edge router. And these routers are basically called as a label switch router. Okay. This is basically called as a label switch router. So now what happened is when the data let me change the color. So now what happened when A send the data to this router, this router is basically check the data and assign the label here. They don't add the routing, they add the label. So these routers are configured with a predefined label. So when the data reach this router, router will read the label and based on that they pass the data to the next router. They will not read the routing lookup and all that, no. They have a predefined label so data will go through that label only. And by end of the day, it deliver the data. So MPL is definitely used for the WAN technology to process the data in a more faster manner. Okay. So it is enhancing the data flow efficiency, but not primarily designed to extend the network scalability. So any question talking about label base, forwarding, traffic, engineering. So answer is basically MPLS by which we can able to pass data. Now second is called as a VXLAN. So VXLAN extend your network segmentation capability by utilizing a VLAN like an encapsulation technique. But with the significantly larger address space, it allow more scalable network segmentation. So it's extending your VLAN. Third is basically called as a STP. STP prevent the network loops. Okay. It is basically introduced to prevent the network loops. Okay. Network loops. Okay. Which is basically create in a LAN environment and organize the network traffic in a tree like structure. And last is called as a GRE. GRE is basically allow for encapsulation of a wide variety of network layer protocol inside the virtual point to point link, but it does not specifically address the scalability. So according to the logic, answer is basically called as a VXLAN. And the reason is MPLS can enhance the efficiency, but it does not specifically address the scalability. VXLAN address the challenge which is mentioned by providing a solution that not only mimic the segmentation capability, but also you can say um, uh, significantly expand the possible number of segments making the ideal for large scale inf infrastructure. So today if you take example of micro segmentation, so we have a network segmentation, okay, where we divide the network into small, small networks. So we have a group of system here and we have some group of systems here. So let's take example. These systems are basically connect with the internet. So we have a different level of security here and then we have a different level of security here because here we have a DNS and all that. So we have a network level segmentation, but today we basically use the micro segmentation where each and every host is separate from other. And to support the micro segmentation, VXLAN play a very important role. So one thing you need to remember VXLAN is the most important component for micro segmentation and micro segmentation is the most important component of zero trust architecture. Okay. VXLAN extending the micro segmentation because VLAN has a limitation. You can create up to this LAN, but now if you want to uh, segment 40,000 hosts, 10,000 hosts, so VXLAN basically support that. So VXLAN is a foundation and most important used to achieve the micro segmentation and micro segmentation is basically the most important part of the zero trust architecture. <clears throat> okay. So Third is STP. STP is crucial for maintaining a loop free network topology in a traditional Ethernet, but it does not increase the number of available network segment. And GRE, as I said, it is actually a tunneling protocol that encapsulate various network layer protocol in a VPN. Okay, so that is the reason answer is B for beta. Let's move to the next coffee shot. Thank you. But before that, take the snacks that VXLAN added flexibility for large scale segmentation allow VXLAN to meet the need to large a multi-tenant public cloud provider and also support the micro segmentation. So let's move to the next coffee shot. As a security architect for financial institution, you are tasked with enhancing the security framework to protect the high value server that handle the sensitive transaction data. 
Given the critical need to isolate these servers from potential internal network threat, which strategy would best enhance security at the granularity level of individual user? Now three statements are there. First statement is basically they have a high value server. Second is they hold the sensitive data. Third is looking for the granularity. So they're looking for a security for the sensitive data and they want to look for the isolation. So option A implement micro segmentation, which makes sense. Option B, enhance traditional network segmentation by creating a separate VLAN for a different departmental server. But, but the problem is that VLAN has a limitations. Deploy ideas, but that is more like a detective solution. Introduce robust firewall rule that restrict access to high value server based on an IP address in protocol. But the problem is that this IP address can be spoof. Okay, by which attacker can bypass. So in this case, the answer is basically A for alpha, where each and every host can be isolated from other. Okay, so micro segmentation, follow the fine grain security controls, isolation of an individual server or a small group of resources here, which is ideal for protecting high value assets. While B also makes sense, but traditional segmentation like VLAN can reduce the attack surface, but it does not provide the same level of detailed isolation. It has a limitation. So that is the reason answer is basically A for alpha. Let's move to the next question. Thank you. Okay, another interesting coffee shot. After reviewing your organization DNS server logs, you discover entries that indicate unauthorized changes to DNS zone files and cache. Keyword here is changes to DNS zone file, which is created in a DNS server. Okay, these alterations have results resulted in a legitimate DNS servers returning the incorrect information to client requests. So based on the nature of incident described, which attack has most likely occurred? So we have an option a DNS poisoning. See, I've seen a lot of people get confused with DNS poisoning and DNS spoofing. So let's first understand what is DNS poisoning attack. See, DNS poisoning is example like this is my DNS server. Okay, so this is basically my DNS server. And this is basically the cache. Let's take a hypothetical scenario. Now in this scenario, so we have uh, details like uh, w w w dot facebook dot com okay so that is basically the ip just give me a second okay so we have a w w dot facebook dot com now what i need here is you know i want to give a ip address to this facebook dot com which is called one dot one dot one dot one so this is basically the IP. So we have a user here. DNS is a service which translate name to IP. So when you type google.com, because human remember alphabet. So we type google.com, translating a Google name to IP address. That is the responsibility of DNS. Same like we have a phone services in our phone, right? Contact details in our, in our phone, right? So we type the name, it is translated into the number and we dial the number. By end of the day, we don't dial name. We actually dial number. So here in computers also we communicate by numbers. So when you type fb.com, let's take a hypothetical scenario. So client is basically, or the server is basically say fb.com is basically on 1.1.1.1. So by this way, user is basically connected to the 1.1.1, which is basically the website of fb. But now what happened, hacker basically hosts one website which is like a phishing website. Okay, he basically hosts the phishing website and IP address is basically 2.1.1.1. And here hacker also configure fake DNS server and make him believe that I am your authorized DNS server and please find the new DNS update that now fb.com will be update on 2.1.1.1. So this server, because it's running on UDP protocol without verifying they accept the entry and now the cache record is moved to 2.1.1.1.1. So now user requesting for facebook.com, they will say fb.com is basically on 2.1.1.1. And by this way, user connect with the 2.1.1, which is hosted by the hacker, a uh, phishing page, which looked like FB and deliver to user. User believe he connected with the FB site. He entered the credentials and we hack his credentials. So DNS poisoning is targeting a DNS server. And for this, we have a countermeasure, which is called as a DNSSEC. So DNSSEC. So DNSSEC is basically all about providing an integrity authenticity. So we have a resource records, 
which is basically signed by the private key okay and it basically is sent to the dns server so dns server basically maintaining a public keys of the dns server by which way we can able to verify the authenticity and integrity of the dns records is it clear so dnsec is offer the integrity and authenticity of the records so question option a makes sense but let's go by the option b so dns spoofing attack is basically the client set attack exactly so in data spoofing we manipulate the query of the clients how let me explain you the concept so you will get a better visibility now let's take example <clears throat> let's take another example which is basically uh, we have a suppose this web user web user okay so this is the user and he basically connected with the switch and here we have a system b so b is the hacker let's take a hypothetical scenario he is a hacker and switch is basically we connected with the router so we we have a router okay and this is basically connected with the internet so a requested for yahoo.com okay as b hacked the system user with the help of arp poisoning the request goes to b so b basically forward to the authorized dns server no no he looking for kk.com so we are not hacked the dns server which is basically hosted there we basically hack the user system and we manipulate the query so that is called dns spoofing attack dns tunneling is deal with the misuse of dns protocol to bypass the security measure for you know data exfiltration which is not directly relevant to describing the manipulation of dns data and d is basically farming attack which focus on broader concept of redirecting you can say um, user uh, to the fraudulent website through dns manipulation or other mean it is more center on end user like sending a phishing email and all that so according to that the answer is basically a for alpha okay because question specifically targeting a dns server modification I'm sorry I took time to explain this topic because it's very important for you to know the thin line difference between the DNS poisoning and DNS cache or DNS poisoning and DNS spoofing. So let's move to the next coffee shot. Thank you. So another interesting question: Which primary protocol? Which primary protocol is commonly used as a you know open standard in the energy to in energy sector to ensure interoperability between the different vendors SCADA? and smart grid application see scada is basically used for the ot so example like we have a plant 1 we have a plant 2 we have a plant 3 okay these are the uh, if you want to know detail about the specific question on cssp and ics security you can go to type prab ics you will get the detailed coffee shot on that okay but in this particular video i have discussed only one question so we have a plants which is basically managed with the help of plcs we called as a plc programmable logic controller and this plcs are basically controlled by the dcs these are basically controlled by the dcs and this dcs is basically controlled by the scada so you can say like that scada is basically the interface from where we have a complete visibility what is happening in the plant it is same like siem so one thing always remember against the ics the biggest concern is basically availability this can be very important from exam point of view because hacker basically try to hack the scada plant and through which they want to gain access of the entire plant so availability is the biggest concern and countermeasure is air gap it mean your ot system should be isolate from the it system so that is a countermeasure we have okay so question saying here is which primary protocol is commonly used as a open standard in the energy sector to ensure interoperability keyword is interoperability between the different vendor scada and smart grid application option is smtp smtp is basically used for the email services sip used in a voip dnp3 is actually a protocol which is used between the different smart devices or this is called smart grid scada systems and all that dce is a collection of individual system that basically work together to support the resource so dnp3 is the converge protocol which is used between the scada system so we have the scada system right they are basically configured from different different vendors so one one protocol which is used 
between this parameters and all that that is basically called as a dnp3 so remember that if dnp3 or if this is basically down it is a problem actually so dnp3 is basically very important and there is a one services also running between this vendor by which they maintain the network connectivity is oce something like that or opx something like that which is basically used for connectivity i have made the detailed video of coffee shot on ic security i highly recommend to check that video which has helped you to clear your exam okay but in this case answer is basically dnp3 dnp3 exactly okay so let me okay so dnp3 is the answer so let's move to the next question thank you okay so next question which protocol is primarily used for carrying a media streaming media stream such as audio video and uh, this one audio video and voip communication telephony and video conferencing it's a very good question actually okay if you read the question carefully you can see which protocol is uh, used for media streaming okay such as audio video and uh, voip communication telephony over the communication so that is the question we have so what are the keywords we need to understand here so option a rtp see rtp is basically a protocol which is uh, you know used for sending a data no doubt in that sip is basically a protocol to establish the session actually okay sip is basically a protocol which is used for establishing a session that is basically called as a SIP. So when the two systems are communicating with each other and all that, they basically use the SIP. So first SIP basically establish the session, okay, between the devices, and then RTP is the one which carry the data. TCP UDP is a very high level term. So only option is basically left here is RTP protocol. But default RTP basically send the data in a plain text. So we have a secure protocol which is used to secure the data, which is called SRTP. secure real time transfer protocol one more important thing is that your voip traffic should be isolated from the other traffic because voip traffic consists of sensitive information and for the voip the most important thing is that qos quality of a services which is come from ipv6 so that is basically play a very important role to enhance the quality of the voip traffic okay so let's move to the next coffee shot thank you okay another interesting question which of the following is not a voip protocol Which of the following is not a VoIP protocol? Option A, H.323. Actually, H.323 is also a VoIP protocol. It was used before SIP. SIP is a protocol. As I said, it is used to establish the session. So, if you have a system A, and if you have a system B, okay. So, between the two systems, it basically first established by the SIP as a session, and then through that session, the data which is carried by the RTP. Today, if you see WhatsApp calls, right now Zoom, Go to Meeting, whatever we are using, in which we are using VoIP only, and VoIP basically support the packet switching technology. So SIP S dot three two three are the protocol. RTP used to carry the data on this particular session. So left with K dot two three three, there is no called as a K dot two three three. So rest is basically VoIP protocol. So answer is basically, yeah. So answer is basically D for Delta. So let's move to the next coffee shot. Thank you. Okay, so we have a next coffee shot. You are tasked with uh, configuring the remote command access to a network device in a highly secure environment. It is essential to choose the most secure protocol available to ensure that command and control communications are protected from unauthorized access. and potential security breaches okay given this scenario which of the following is the most secure most secure protocol for remote command access to the firewall so question talking about you looking to configure the remote commands okay and uh, you looking for the secure solution which can protect against the breaches and you want to use this protocol for remotely managing a firewall so you can un understand if someone hack your firewall management console and all that you, you can understand what is the further damage he can do so first option is basically ftp see ftp is not used for the remote command ftp used for accessing a remote data and all that so let's say example we have a server here we host some file in this okay so as a user i want to access this file from anywhere so i will configure on the ftp port number 2021 and i can remotely access this file with the help of ftp protocol by the browser 
Telnet is basically send the data in a plain text. So we have a system A, which is a DOS based system, DOS based system, which is the old systems. And this is another system, which is a DOS based system. So today, okay, if I want to remotely take the access of the remote DOS, I will use the command called Telnet space IP address of the target system. So by that I can take a remote access of the system command interpreter. Okay. So let me show you the example. Suppose I have a CMD console here. So this is a CMD console. Let's take example and I type basically telnet space IP address. So by that what happened is I can able to access the remote prompt of the remote IP. But telnet with the problem is that it sent the data in a plain text actually. So telnet basically send the data in plain text. So if you basically establishing a telnet session over the firewall, anyone can basically intercept. RPC is basically used for remote uh, connections and all that. RPC is just, you know, it's used for the network for a file synchronizations and all that. So two systems, when they communicate over the network, RPC basically play a very important role as a services. You don't configure RPC default. It's default enable. So only option left is SSH. So SSH stand for secure shell. Today, if you want to remotely manage any firewalls, remotely manage any servers. So you, with the help of SSH, you establish the session and through that particular session, you basically remotely manage the configuration. One more important thing you need to remember from exam point of view, SSH basically offer four important services. The first service, it basically offer authentication. Okay. The first service, it basically offer authentication. Second service, it basically offer compression. Okay. Second service, it basically offer compression. The third service is basically offer, which is called as a confidentiality. I don't know today what is what happening with my writing. So next is basically called as a confidentiality and fourth is basically called as a integrity. Okay. So authenticity, authentication is there, compression is there, confidentiality is there and integrity is there. So all four functions is basically offered by SSH. So here the question talking about remotely command access to firewall and you want to protect against all kinds of breaches, mm -hmm. then answer is definitely will go with the answer, which is called as a SSH. Okay. So let's move to the next question. Thank you. So after this, so SSH is the answer. Let's move to the next coffee shot. It's also a very interesting coffee shot. It is a very important topic from exam point of view. Okay. So question is basically talking about here is you are a architect responsible for designing the network security architecture for your organization. Okay. Network security. Okay. Keyword is network security as a part of your organization, as a part of your responsibility, you are tasked with building a DMZ to enhance the security between your internal network and internet. Based on best practice for DMZ architecture, which of the following servers should not be placed in the DMZ. So let's first understand the purpose of DMZ. Okay. So traditionally what traditionally tradition, if you take example, if you see the traditional scenario, what happened? We used to have one network. Okay. So let me to use this. Okay. So traditionally what happened, we used to have a, two, uh, you know, one network. So we have a host A, we have a host B, we have a host C and we have a host C D. This is basically my database. This is basically my active directory. This is basically my DNS and this is basically my web server. Let's take a hypothetical scenario. They are basically connected on the internet. So we are into the e-commerce site. Okay. So we have a lot of user, user one, user two, user three. They basically connect with the internet. Okay. So let's take a hypothetical scenario is user basically use the internet and by which they access the website. So it is easy for anyone to do the attack because there is no firewall. So what we did, we basically installed the firewall here. Now, if I consider the web server, I have to limit the rules because if I put too much restriction, it will impact the performance. Like every traffic, every packet go through detail inspection. It is same like security check at the airport. And if I don't do the too much security, then anyone can hack the web server. And from there they hack the database because database hold the sensitive information. If I basically respect the database, I need to put more restriction. And if I respect the web server, I need to have a less restriction. So what I need here is I want some kind of a segregation. And this is basically where we introduce the concept of DMZ. So now what happened, we have a one network in which we keep those systems 
in the DMZ, which is a public facing site. So for example, web server I want to place, DNS I want to place, bastion host I want to keep. It is basically act like a dump, jump server. Then we can have another firewall and then we can have an internal network where we can keep our sensitive server like Active Directory and database. Okay, so now what happened user? So we have a firewall here. So we have a user here. User basically asks for the traffic. Firewall basically inspect, validate everything. From there it goes to the web server and he get a traffic access. In worst case, if they hack this also, from there he tried to attempt access and all that, this firewall will have a more restrictions. So one more important objective of DMZ is to protect your internal network from external attack because all the traffic is terminate on the DMZ. Okay. Now question saying that DM, uh, in DMZ, which server we don't place. So SMTP gateway we definitely place because of the email services. FTP we have to pay where a lot of users are there who want to access the files from the multiple location. We also keep the DNS also for the name translation, but we never keep the database in the DMZ. So that is the reason answer is database. Okay. So let's move to the next question because DNS, FTP, SMTP, we can keep it in the DMZ, but database we cannot keep because database basically hold the sensitive information. This is also called as a screen subnet architecture, very expensive, very transparent, which is now common practice in the organization. Okay. So let's move to the next question. Another interesting question, a protocol used for monitoring and managing device across the organization network has become target for remote attackers. This protocol is basically uh, providing a detailed device. This protocol by providing a detailed device network infrastructure information can be exploited to gain unauthorized access to network devices, potentially compromising the entire network security. Upon investigation, you discover that these incidents are due to the exploitation of a protocol used for a monitoring and managing these devices. It means they have exploited the protocol which is used for managing the devices. Given the scenario where, where a network protocol is being exploited by the attacker to access network infrastructure, which of the following protocol is most likely to be involved due to its critical role in the network device management? So question talking about which protocol they have used, which is used to for the monitoring. So FTP never used for monitoring. SMTP is basically used for sending email, which is used in a mail server. SSH only for remote management, not for the remote monitoring. With the SSH, we basically take the remote access of the system. Okay. The only option left is SNMP. So answer is basically SNMP because SNMP is basically used for the remote monitoring and all that. So example in SNMP, what happened is we used to have a manager, which is called as a SNMP manager. So we have a system A, we have a system B, we have a system C and we have a system D. Okay. So SNMP manager basically have a data, which is called as a MIB management information base. Okay, so they are basically connected on the port number 161, 162, 160, 161 something. Okay, so if the SN, SN, SNMP port is enabled on the system, that port is so strong that remotely with that help of port, I can able to extract the configuration from the device. What is the current services? What is the current users? What are the current open shared files? I get everything. So that's why it is used for monitoring. So a lot of monitoring tool use a SNMP protocol for doing a monitoring on the systems. So default what happened, these systems are configured on the public string. So server also configure the public string, which is called as a default string. So by this, anyone can become manager and they can, they can able to retrieve all the configuration detail of this host. So countermeasure is basically configure the private string. This is the exam question. This can be the exam question. So private string is basically restrict the security. Private string is basically used to protect the security and all that. So if the infrastructure is configured with the SNMP public string, it's a concern. So countermeasure is restrict to private strings or enable the SNMP version three, which basically offer the great security. So if SNMP is exploited through which we can have a complete visibility on the network configuration. So that is the reason answer is basically D for Delta. Okay. D for Delta SNMP. So UDP port 161 used by SNMP agent, which is used to receive the request and UDP port 162 used by the management console 
to receive the response and notification okay so that is the most important part okay next coffee shot network administrator is designing a secure network architecture which of the following design principle aim to mitigate risk associated with the management traffic and improve overall network security posture i repeat again a network administrator is designing a secure network architecture which of the following design principle aim to mitigate the risk associated with the management traffic and improve the overall network security posture so option a all network traffic should be encrypted regardless of its purpose which is true actually no doubt all traffic should be encrypted okay whatever the two systems are communicating and all that it should be encrypted no doubt in that okay i agree with that but question saying that design principle mitigate the risk associated with the management traffic now what is management traffic is example we have a system a which is owned by the administrator and he want to connect with the data center to manage this machine so make sure that network should be secure no one should able to intercept okay so question is talking about that how to secure that so option a all network traffic should be encrypted regardless of its purpose that is gone which is also true management traffic for network device such as configurational changes should be isolate on a separate network which is true because if attacker is in the same network even he intercept definitely he can he cannot able to read the traffic but offline he can able to brute force and extract the password so we have to make sure if this is the network using for remote management of the server and all that this should be isolate from the other traffic okay option c network device should be directly accessible from the internet for remote management which is a bad practice and option d called utilize the same physical port for both data management on network device that is also vulnerable for availability confidentiality so in this case the answer is basically a and b both are correct now this is how the question look like both look correct but think like a manager okay if i just have a encrypted traffic and other also sending the data on the same network there is a possibility they can intercept the encrypted traffic so better is basically we can have a physical isolation okay because while encryption is crucial for sensitive data encrypting all traffic can be computationally expensive and impact the network performance also and it is more efficient to prioritize encryption for a specific type of traffic based on the sensitivity on the other side if you take example of management traffic and all that which makes sense that's the reason answer is basically b for beta so isolation is more secure than encryption okay so let's move to the next topic next coffee shop thank you okay so next coffee shot an organization adopt ipv6 over ipv4 one of the anticipated improvement is enhanced handling of quality of a services priority value what is the primary benefit of implementing a quality of a services priority value in the network see quality of a services play a very important role in last 10 years where you are sending a different type of traffic on the same network now let's understand the quality of a services with the one basic example let's say example this is basically the house we have okay and we in this house we only have a one small gate now we have a one two three four so we have a four people now in one go the all four people cannot go out of four two people are hungry out of that one person is more hungry so we label them as a important and we prioritize this person should go first then other person go so this is how we are prioritizing a traffic so today when you see the video conferences and all that audio video is parallelly sending over the network traffic and thanks to quality of our services only so question say organization adopt ipv6 over ipv4 and because of the quality of service so what is the primary benefit so option a remove the need for both dhcp network translation which is not true because dhcp has no connect with quality of our services dhcp is the ip Uh, it is basically a server which assign the ip and nat is a service which translate public ip to private ip ultimate goal of a nat is to hide your internal network and ultimate goal of a dhcp is to automate the ip address option b traffic management based on prioritized content which makes sense because based on a label and all that we prioritize the traffic option c give administrator the ability to group and block or allow access on network server which is not true because quality of a service one more important thing it is directly deal with the availability and option d is better security which is not true so in this case the answer is basically yeah so answer is b for beta okay b for beta so let's move to the next question thank you yeah so 
सो क्वेश्चन इज विच टाइप ऑफ विच प्रैक्टिस शुड अ सिक्योरिटी प्रोफेशनल ओके बी मोस्ट कंसर्न अबाउट इफ इट्स टेकिंग एडवांटेज ऑफ यूजर हु मिस टाइप द डोमेन द की वर्ड इज बेसिकली मिस टाइप द डोमेन सो इफ यू सी जी ओ ओ जी एल ई डॉट कॉम ओके सो दैट इज अ वन थिंग एंड देन जी ओ ओ ओ ओ जी एल ई डॉट कॉम सो देर अ लॉट ऑफ यूजर्स ओके हु बेसिकली टाइप एक्स्ट्रा जीरो और एक्स्ट्रा ओ और लेस और यू नो वन वन ओ विच इज लेस सो वॉट हैपन इज नॉर्मली इफ इफ इट्स दिस इज हैपन नॉर्मली यू गेट अ एरर इज पेज इज नॉट फाउंड इन ऑल दैट बट हैकर इज बेसिकली यूजिंग दिस ऑपरचुनिटी एंड होस्ट अ वेबसाइट on such kind of a url and waiting for the people who does mistake so they they believe that okay if do if they do mistake we might redirect them to our website so this is basically the attack called typo scatty okay so option a phishing attack phishing attack you receiving a mass mail you receiving one lottery email you click on that that is a phishing we also have one category of phishing which is called as a sphere phishing now in the case of sphere phishing sphere phishing we targeting a particular domain okay in sphere phishing we basically targeting a particular domain second is basically called as a typo squatting this is actually typo squatting is only because it is a practice employed to take advantage when user is mistype the domain name or ip address option c man in the middle attack it is more like a two, two you know two systems are communicating you intercept and last is basically called as a homograph attack homograph attack is basically from a dns perspective okay so this attack leverage the similarity in character set to register the uh faked phone numbers or phony international domain names that to the naked i ip or you can say naked i appear legitimate so that is a different thing so in this case answer is basically answer is typo squatting okay so let's move to the next question thank you which protocol is primarily used to determine the health of a network or a specific link within the network now three keywords are there specific link that is the one keyword we have second is basically we have a network okay link so we looking for the protocol which determine the health of the network link within the network option a icmp which makes sense because when we have a system a and we have a system b whenever i want to check whether system b is available we send the request which is called ping command we use we use the tool which is called as a ping which stand for packet intranet grofer and he use the icmp echo request it basically use the icmp echo request to b if b is basically up it will reply echo reply so that's why you see the reply time reply and all that so icmp basically use to check the connectivity snmp use for monitoring okay bgp is a routing protocol which is used to communicate between the two different enterprise network and igmp is for the multicasting so only close option here is basically called as a icmp because icmp protocol is basically check the network links and everything okay and uh, it is basically used for the connectivity and all that okay so that's the reason icmp we have a attacks also on the icmp we'll discuss later which is called smurf attack and fraggle attack so let's move to the next question okay it's another interesting question what type of attack target the dynamic nature of arp cache by introducing falsified information to disrupt the network communication see first of all arp is a protocol which translate name to ip and ip to name ip to mac address sorry ip to mac address mac address to ip address okay now question specifically talking about arp cache so what is first arp cache let's understand so we have a system a okay so we have a system a ip address of the system a is basically suppose 10.0.0.2 and mac address is basically at 7 h9 and it is basically connect with the switch and here we have a system b okay which is basically called as a 10.0.0.2 
0 dot 3 and here we have a router which IP address is basically 10 dot 0 dot 0 dot 1 okay now MAC address of 10 dot 0 dot 0 dot 1 is basically suppose FF this is basically MAC address of 10 dot 0 1 and 3 MAC address is basically 9B H9 so what happened every system basically maintain the ARP table that ARP table is basically maintain the neighbor IP and MAC address information which is dynamic in nature so here we maintain the information which is called 10 dot 0 dot 0 dot 1 and MAC address is basically F sorry F H 7 and second is basically called as a 10 dot 0 dot 0 dot 3 MAC address is 9 B okay H 9 so that is basically the MAC address so now what happened attacker basically normally the request is for him the default gateway is basically called as a 10 dot 0 dot 0 dot 1 okay so if you want to access Google if you see the OSI model application presentation session transport network layer they will see 10 dot 0 1 is basically is a gateway to access the internet so they will see in the ARP table that 10 dot 0 1 is mapped to which MAC address so it is mapped to FH H7 it sent the request to switch switch will check f fh7 is basically on which particular port on that particular port it send the data this is how the switch work on point to point and by this way it send the request to router now what b did b basically poison the arp table of the remote system we have a tool by which remotely we can able to poison the name of the tool is cane enable and here what happened is they replace the 10.001 mac address with 9b h9 so he basically add his mac address here 9b h9 okay so that is basically the mac address we have so now what happened next time when he type google.com he will check the gateway is basically 10.01 and when you look into the arp table one is basically mapped with 9b h9 so they attach 9b h9 now okay so that is what we have so now what happen is when you type google.com or whatever is there so in this case the 9b h9 they basically attach so the request goes to the switch on 9b h9 and it is basically hosted by the hacker so whatever now a setting it is basically intercepted by the b and then it goes to the router so this is also when you connecting with the wi-fi at the uh, airport your wi-fi at the hotel you are vulnerable for this attack because remotely hacker basically poison your arp table and manipulate that so countermeasure is create a static ARP entry that okay this is the IP and this is the Mac but problem is that if you restart the system you will lose the data so most effective is the port security which is on the switch like okay this back will only work on this port if you have two Mac on a different port it will not work so this kind of a security we have so if you remember one thing from exam point of view the most effective countermeasure for ARP poisoning option a uh, static ARP cache and second is basically port security select port security because if you restart the system again you back to sa same okay now here the question talking about which type of attack target the dynamic nature of ARP cache by introducing the falsified information to disrupt the network communication see one thing you need to understand domain 4 in the exam they will not test you technical you need to understand technicals then only you can able to understand where it works so example like they will give you a risk they will give you the attacks so until unless you don't know how it works it is difficult for you to answer the question i'm not telling you to configure arp and all that but you should know what is arp then only you can able to answer where it works understood so dns spoofing is basically where here we actually doing a dns spoofing so if he's sending a dns request it goes through the system b so he will manipulate the dns cache and forward to the server but it is not dns spoofing attack arp spoofing is the attack I, it's not an IP spoofing. We are basically manipulating the ARP table of the system A. It is not a MAC flooding. Now, what is MAC flooding is? MAC flooding is basically mean, let me explain you MAC flooding also. So, let's say example, we have a switch here. Okay, and this is the hacker. Okay, so this is the hacker. 
सो वॉट हैकर डिट हैकर बेसिकली यूज अ टूल विच इज कॉल्ड एज अ इथर फ्लड ओके ही यूज द टूल विच इज कॉल्ड इथर फ्लड सो विद द हेल्प ऑफ इथर फ्लड वॉट हैपन एवरी सेकेंड ही जनरेटिंग अ न्यू मैक एड रेसेंडिंग टू द स्विच एवरी सेकेंड ही जनरेटिंग अ न्यू मैक एड रेसेंडिंग टू द स्विच सो स्विच बेसिकली हैव अ कैम टेबल मैक टेबल सो इट विल एक्सेप्ट द न्यू मैक एड्रेस एंड रिमूव द ओल्ड मैक एंट्री सो नाउ इन दिस टेबल इट ऑलरेडी मेनटेन अ फेक मैक एंट्रीज सो नाउ वी हैव अ सिस्टम बी वी हैव अ सिस्टम सी वी हैव अ सिस्टम डी वी हैव अ सिस्टम ई नाउ ई वॉन्ट टू सेंड द डेटा टू बी सो वेन ही सेंड द डेटा टू स्विच स्विच विल चेक इन टू द मैक टेबल इफ यू कुड नॉट एबल टू फाइंड द मैक इट विल सिंपली ब्रॉडकास्ट द डेटा सो दैट इज वाई मैक फ्लडिंग इज बेसिकली कन्वर्ट द स्विच इन टू द ब्रॉडकास्ट मोड बट द क्वेश्चन इज नॉट टॉकिंग अबाउट दैट द क्वेश्चन वॉज स्पेसिफिकली टॉकिंग अबाउट ओके द क्वेश्चन वॉज स्पेसिफिकली टॉकिंग अबाउट फॉल्सिफाइड डेनस ए आर पी कैशे एंड दैट इज द रीजन इन दिस केस आंसर इज ए आर पी स्पूफिंग अटैक फॉर मैक फ्लडिंग द ओनली द काउंटर मेजर इज वन मैक वन पोर्ट ओके वन मैक वन पोर्ट ओके दैट इज अ वन थिंग यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड ओके वन मैक वन पोर्ट See, implement port security is most effective. Then update the ARP cache. Okay, so let's move to the next question. Thank you. Another interesting question. You can expect some wireless security question scenario based. Okay, as the security manager of rapidly expanding corporation, you are tasked with revising the wireless security measure to address growing concern over the network breaches associated with the user authentication flaw. The current security framework rely on the single shared key another problem statement shared key for all the user which has proven insufficient to enhance the security measure while accommodating the individual user access which protocol should you use to consider option a transition to move to advanced protocol that support the individual user credential instead of shared key because by that way you can able to establish the accountability which makes sense option b continue with the current protocol but enhance it with the multi factor authentication to strengthen the user verification process which is also true but it, it involve the cost also maintain the existing setup but enforce more rigorous network monitoring and ideal but that is more like a detective control and option d opt for direct connection strategy eliminate reliance on wireless communication to reduce the vulnerability point it's just a stupidity so the answer is basically in this case i will go with the a transition to a more you can say advanced protocol okay that support the individual user credential instead of shared key streams i'll tell you why see when you're talking about the wireless in wireless we basically have a different type of security protocol the first one and if you want to practice really a w wireless security question there's a dedicated coffee shot i made on the wireless security also i highly request i humble request please check that because that give you more clarity about the different type of wireless security standards questions based on cissp so what happened in the wireless the one important standard that we use is wep wired equivalent privacy now what happened we have a system a we have a system b and this is basically my access point so wep is basically use a key which is called 64 bit in which 40 bit is actually a key and 24 bit is the iv value so if a sending a same data b sending a same data it is basically xor with the unique key so iv plus key plus xor with the plain text data so this is the plain text data we have so if a sending a text called prab and b also sending a prab and both have a same key which is called key 1 and we have a key 1 definitely if you go by the logic same key encrypting a same text produce the same cipher text but now what happen key 1 is basically add with the iv so iv used to randomize the key iv basically used to randomize the key so example like key is basically called as a key 1 plus iv value i keep 24 and that is basically encrypting a word called prab okay then we have a second called key 1 plus iv value is basically 25 encrypting a word called prab so even you basically have a same text and same key but you have a different output but problem is that each user has a same key so i am looking for something like a scalable solution because it's a current security framework on rely on a single shared key when everyone have a same key that when you when you come to the house and all that everyone get a same key but when you go to the office and all that we use the concept of captive portal and this is basically where captive portal captive portal okay so we basically called as a captive portal let me show you that how it works 
so captive portal we have so what happened now we have a access point this is the access point wireless access point and it is basically connect with the radius and radius is basically connect with the ad so now what happen user basically connect with the ap ap has a protocol called wpa2 which is called enterprise he forward the request to radius so radius basically so here what happen is radius will tell the ap ask him for username and password so instead of asking for only pass key now it is asking for the username and password you know when you go to hotel and all that you connect with the wifi uh, without any password but it redirect you to the some home page so you enter the username and you enter the password the information go to ap because the wpa2 protocol with the help of eap standard he pass the information to radius and from radius is pass the information to ad now ad is the one who verify the credential so now what happen is different different user basically have a different different credentials so it is scalable also and it is basically used for the enterprise validation that is why we basically went with the answer a for alpha okay that is why we basically went with the answer a for alpha so let's move to the next question thank you okay so next question which wan protocol directs data across network based on label rather than longer network address enhancing routing efficiency and speed see in this the question has a keyword called label okay so first is called as a bgp see bgp is a protocol designed for making a routing decisions based on the path not a label path network policies they have a rules which is set between the different autonomous system on the internet so it does not use a short path label for routing decision but instead focus on the path selection and routing policy so bgp is not an answer option b ospf ospf is basically a you can say interior gateway protocol that is use a link state routing used within the enterprise okay so it is actually determine the best route based on a shortest path methodology but does not use a path label option c mpls mpls actually true because it use a label based forwarding and based on that forward the data so let me explain you how the mpls works so let's say example um, we have a road 1 and we have a road 2 okay so we have a road 1 and we have a road 2 okay now you want to travel you want to go from road 1 so you want to go from here to here so you're not using any google map okay please understand this you're not using any google map okay so you basically go every t point here you ask at every t point should i go left or should i go right left or right left or right and then you reach but when it comes to the google map you have a predefined route and you know you have to go through that particular route only so you tell me in the comment box which one is faster the route with google mpls is basically follow the same technique only so in mpls instead of going to every router look for the routing lookup which take time processing and then pass the information they basically use the concept of uh, what we called as a label based forwarding so how it works we have a router here let's say example and this is basically the mpls cloud we called okay mpls cloud multi protocol label switching cloud and here we have another router and here we have a system b okay so now what happen here we using one network which is called x.25 which send the data in their format so this is the format this is basically called as a device which is called as a ler label as router so when the data pass through this router this router will basically assign the label to that that's it and now these are the router on the mpls called as a lsr lsr so when the packet pass through this router this router will basically use the label and based on the label it pass the information okay so any question talking about label based forwarding traffic range generating answer is basically mpls okay and last is basically called as a rip so rip stand for routing information protocol it is one of the oldest routing protocol which use distance vector so in this case answer is basically c for charlie so any question specifically talking about traffic reengineering label based forwarding answer is mpls okay okay so one more example is suppose you sending some package to me 
you mention in some Russian address. So the DHL is the MPLS here. So for them, it doesn't matter what is mentioned in the address. Understood? So for them, it doesn't mean it doesn't matter what address is there. So when this DHL router receive the particular package, they will label as a their unique code. And when it basically pass through this particular DHL agents, they use that unique code to pass the information. So they don't check again and again routing information pass the data. So that is the reason answer is C for Charlie. Okay, so this is the thing. Let's move to the next question. Thank you. So next question, multinational corporation is facing a challenges with the lateral movement of threats within its network infrastructure. Now, what is lateral movement? Lateral movement basically mean moving from one network to another network. Okay, moving from one network to another network that is called as a lateral movement, which has resulted in a several data breaches that affecting a sensitive high value server. The security team is considering various method to enhance their network defense strategy. Which of the following solution most effectively address the cooperation problem by limiting the scope of access to network resource on a granular level, thereby potential continue, uh, potentially containing such threats. So the question talking about there is a lateral movement is happening. Lateral movement is basically like you are moving from uh, let's say example we have a we have a network here so we have a dmz okay so we have a host here and here we have a host so hacker basically hack into one of the network and from there he moved to the internal network that is why we introduce a zero trust architecture and all that to make sure if he have access maximum he has access to this particular system only question say there is a data breach because lateral movement and they're looking for a solution to containing that threat, containing and reducing the impact. Option A, deploy application aware firewall within each department network segment. We can do that, but that is more about monitoring the application content, what is happening, how it can basically prevent my lateral movement. Option B, upgrading existing border firewall to next generation firewall. Again, if he able to bypass the firewall, he can easily move from one network to another network. Option C, adopting a micro segmentation to create a multiple isolated subzone within the internal network, which makes sense. And option D, implementing a NAC system to enforce security policies for each device accessing the network. See, again, NAC is basically ensure only this approved configuration will be part of a network. Now, there is a possibility hacker hack one of the configured approved system and from there he can do the lateral movement. What about its internal threat? So the most effective countermeasure is micro segmentation where the each and every host is virtually segment from others so in the worst case if we hack one system and infected with the virus it is impact one system only and for your information remember that micro segmentation is also the foundation parameter for a zero trust architecture it's a foundation component of zero trust architecture okay micro segmentation is basically involved dividing the internal network into numerous isolated subzones Actually, we can do that. And by implementing micro segmentation, we use the internal segmented firewalls, subnet, VXLAN and all that. And this approach actually limit the lateral movement of threat within the network and thereby enhancing the security and specifically addressing the problem of data breaches, which is part of an internal threat. That is the reason answer is, uh, you know, C for Charlie. Okay, so let's move to the next question. It's a very interesting question actually. The question say, which of the following is the primary benefit the QoS provide to the organization network? Option A, protect the integrity of a data network under load by verifying data accuracy, consistency. That is more about data signature, so that is gone. Option B, enhancing the availability of the data network under the load by managing bandwidth and prioritizing traffic, which makes sense. Ensure the confidentiality of a data network under load by encrypting data packet, no. And option D, preventing unauthorized access to data network under the load by implementing strict access control, but that is again a confidentiality. Ultimate goal of QoS is to base, make sure we prioritize the traffic and provide the availability for data. And that is the reason answer is B for beta, yes. B for beta. So let's move to the next question. Thank you. Another interesting question. An enterprise requires a solution to support 
diverse authentication method across its network due to the varying security requirement and device capability as a security risk manager which framework should you implement to facilitate these different authentication technique effectively see there is a dedicated video i made on the authentication protocol based on a cssp syllabus i highly recommend to check that it will really help you to get more understanding of domain 4 authentication protocols in the description box you can check that please 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 watch that video if you're preparing for cssp and cisa exam so here the question says enterprise require a solution to support the diverse authentication diverse authentication mean we have wireless we have wired we have vpn so we want to manage multi vendor authentication and as a security risk manager which framework we can use see first is basically called eap second is called as a chap c is called ldap and d is called as a pap so let me eliminate ldap because ldap is a directory management services so example like if you take example of your phone okay you know that okay you have a bad habit it is difficult for you to remember the uh, remember the numbers so what you did you basically save the numbers with a name so there is a directory in your phone which translate name to number so ldap is used to organize the information so same like that ldap is basically used to organize your user directory so that is why i'm directly eliminating c now d say pap pap is a peer to peer authentication so let's say example uh, we have a system a let me reduce the font size so we have a system a and we have a system b and we have a system c and we have a system d simple is if c a and d want to access the b he need to know the password of b so a basically request for access okay a basically request for access hypothetical scenario b basically ask for username and password a provide the username and a provide password in a plain text whatever the username he enter whatever the password he enter and send to the b so there is a hacker who basically intercept this entire information and it is easy for him to see that so pap is used for peer to peer authentication sent the information in the plain text okay it is also called as a static authentication because whatever the password you have you enter the same value second is basically chap because this address a chap so in chap what happen is we have a system a and we have a system b okay and we have a system c and we have a system d now let's say a hypothetical scenario d want to access so b basically sent him a nonce value nonce is basically the random value so he get a pop up enter the username enter the password the password is basically used to encrypt the nonce and send back to the b so that's why we called he request for access they sent a challenge and you encrypt the challenge that is called response now c also have a same password he request but b sent him a different nonce value so that is why it's called as challenge handshake authentication protocol which is called as a dynamic authentication okay pap is static dynamic chap is basically used to prevent the replay attack also replay attack mean if someone capture this and right try to use and reuse again it will not work because it only work nonce one time one session so chap and pap is basically overcome because it is more used from the peer to peer authentication perspective now eap is most scalable okay i telling you again if you check my authentication protocol i have covered more than 5 questions on eap and there is a coffee snacks is there i cannot cannot make this uh, video more you know lengthy and all that's why i have not discuss in detail so but for your information eap is used for multi vendor authentication how let's say example this is my vpn server this is my dial up server this is basically my access point okay so i have some users over the internet who connecting my vpn i have some users who are using a dial up and i have some internal user who want to connect with the ap all this request what i want i want to go through a centralized process so here we install the radius radius and radius is basically connect with the ad and it is basically connect with the certificate authority okay 
So now what happened? User basically send the request to VPN. VPN basically ask for the username password. He provide the username password. Okay, to VPN. VPN basically pass the information to Radius. This is basically carried by the protocol which is called as a EAP. EAP basically have a multiple version. EAP basically Leap, which is a pure password based authentication. Then they have a EAP TLS. Then they have a PEEP. And then we have a EAP TTLS. So as I said, I don't have a time to discuss, but for information in Leap, we are sending a password in the TLS, client sending a certificate, server sending a certificate, PEEP, client sending a username password, server sending a certificate, EAP TTLS, similar like PEEP, over the virtual tunnel we send the data. Now in this case, VPN basically have their own authentication, dial-up basically have their own authentication, access point basically have their own authentication, but encapsulate all this authentication in common format, it is carried by the EAP. And EAP pass the information to Radius. Radius basically pass the information to AD. AD basically verify and authorize the radius. Radius basically authorize the VPN, then we get access. So EAP is basically more scalable. So when you're having a different authentication, diverse authentication, and you want to carry this authentication, there we use a EAP protocol. Now in this, there's a challenge with radius. When you configure radius, you configure with AAA server, authentication, authorization, accounting. You don't have option to customize. Second is what information you're sending here Example, even if it's a username is plain text and password is encrypted, if any internal threat is there, he can able to intercept what you're sending. So conversation is plain text. It means the session is plain text. In that, we can see username is going and password encrypt value is going. So Redis is not that secure. That is why today we basically use the most secure scalable solution, which is called as a TA CA CS plus TA TECAS plus TA. C A C S plus because TechAS plus support TCP. We have option to customize. You want to make it only as a authentication server. You want to make it as an authorization server. So we have an option to customize. And third, the information between this to AD, it is basically encrypted. So if you get option, which one is be better, Radius or TechAS Plus, select TechAS Plus. But now we have an alternate of Radius also as an open source because TechAS Plus is a Cisco proprietary. So diameter is introduced now. So di diameter basically address all the limitation of Radius as an open source. It encrypt the session, it use TCP and communicate in a more secure manner. Okay. So in this case, yeah. So in this case, answer is basically EAP. Okay, so if you really want to discuss more in detail about EAP, TLS, CHAP and PAP, so you can check my that coffee shop that give you the better visibility about the topics. Okay, so let's move to the next topic. Huh? Go ahead. So John, an IT administrator is encountering delays in a video conferencing services during a uh, during a peak business hour which are critical to the company operation the delay result in uh, stuttering and dropped connections leading to unacceptable performance degradation which technology should john implement to prioritize this time sensitive traffic and mitigate the risk of associated with delay thereby ensuring a sustained availability and performance so actually answer is quality services because we already covered three questions. So quality service basically help you to prioritize. But why other option is wrong? See load balancer can distribute traffic evenly across network resource and it also help to mitigate some type of performance issues. But it is less effective in prioritizing the specific type of traffic like real time video conferencing and all that. Load balancer we use in that case when we having a multiple servers who providing a services. So like, let's say example we have a web server. Okay. So we have web server one, we have web server two and we have web server three. So all three are basically connected with the load balancer. Okay, so request is coming to load balancer. They discover the load according to the, they pass the information to other server. So it's work on the active active. Second is, third is called as a bandwidth throttling. See, when we're talking about uh, bandwidth throttling, it is basically involved limiting the bandwidth of a certain type of traffic. 
although it can be used for free up the bandwidth for priority application but it does not inherently prioritize traffic based on its importance or sensitive to delay and last is basically called as the d network traffic analysis network traffic analysis is a tool used for monitoring analyzing a network traffic to identify the bottleneck or anomaly while this can be useful for diagnostic purpose but it does not by itself prioritize traffic and making its less effective solution for immediate performance so that is the reason answer is a for alpha which is called as a quality of a services here you can see some snacks section when you see the quality of a services by monitoring and managing the quality of a services essential communication and the related business operation process and task may have their availability sustain and protect and qs deal with the availability let's move to the next question thank you another interesting question what are potential risk when deploying voip phone on the same switch as desktop and server system the question say what are the potential risks when deploying voip phone on the same switch as desktop and it mean you are connecting the voip switch along with the other desktop and server in the same switch okay option a this configuration enhance overall network security by consolidating traffic which is actually opposite if we hack the desktop from there i can able to hack the intercept of the voip traffic which is not true option b there is no significant risk as a voip and data traffic are inherently secure we cannot assume because default uh, rtp send the data in a plain text so we have to use tls option c this could allow 802.1x authentication falsification as well as vlan be wipe hoping that is possible and d is basically the configuration simplify the network and has no downside it has a downside it can be single point of failure so first of all let's understand the c statement because c is right deploying the voip phones on the same network switches as a desktop and server system can expose network to specific attack like vlan vlan hoping is also there and compromising the 802 because we can capture the authentication increase the security risk okay 802.1x mean you are implementing the uh, port based security or carrying a eap based access okay now first let's understand the vlan hoping so vlan hoping is basically a computer security exploit which allow attacker to access network resource on a vlan that are normally inaccessible it mean we are trying to access from one system to other system within a two different vlan that is basically called as a vlan hoping now what is wipe hoping here is wipe hoping it allow pc on the internal network to jump into the vlan and run several different type of attacks so that is basically called as a wipe hoping more of the so i mean if you are in a same network or different network you can able to intercept the other traffic data also so that is the reason answer is basically c for charlie yes c for charlie so let's move to the next question thank you <clears throat> okay so an enterprise is experiencing a challenges in securing its voice and video communication transmit by sip voip technology as a security risk manager what is the most effective best practice to implement to mitigate potential security risk and enhancing the overall security of this critical communication so question talking about they experiencing a challenge in securing its voice and video and they they looking for a most effective practice to implement mitigate the potential security risk which enhance the overall security of its critical communications problem statement is communication option a use vlan to separate voice and video from other network traffic which makes sense option b enforce authentication for all the network user see while it's important for overall network security strong authentication but strong authentication does not specifically address the unique risk associated with the voip communication as directly as a network segmentation option c harden all sip voip devices and software again hardening devices and software is crucial but it is more focus on reducing the vulnerability within the device rather than addressing the risk of traffic intercepting or network wide attack updating antivirus is also okay but again it doesn't help you directly to protect the communication so answer is basically vlan because vlan is basically used to segregate your voip traffic from id traffic okay always remember and this practice effectively use everywhere so they basically isolate the voice okay and video traffic from other data traffic and reducing the risk of voip communication being disrupted or intercepted by the activities okay and it also enhances the security by containing any potential breach to the single segment of the network because physical segmentation will be very expensive so let's move to the next question a security analyst review the organization server logs 
and notice frequent connection on port number 3389590443 and 22 considering the standard use of this port which should the analyst prioritize for further investigation to potentially identify unauthorized remote access see 443 is typically used for https traffic which is encrypted so even it is happening it is okay option b 22 is used for ssh which is known for a secure remote administration capability but it can be target for attack it generally implies the encrypted and authenticated traffic option c 3389 3389 is used for rdp which if if it's not properly configure then it can take a full control of our computer and d is basically called as a 44547 which is for the other services okay but here we talking about the concern here is what so answer is basically c for charlie because 3389 is basically the more concern for us because if someone is establishing a 3389 he remotely establishing a system remotely taking a desktop of the system is it clear so i'm so i want to correct that it is not 5900 it is basically 44547 okay so that's my mistake so answer is basically c because 44322 it's for the remote administrations and all that but more biggest concern i want to see that who taking a remote desktop so 3389 is basically for me the primary concern so let's move to the next question thank you okay very interesting question large healthcare provider is facing a significant challenge in managing the security of its expanding network especially with increasing number of devices connecting daily some of which do not comply with the organization stringent security policy this situation has raised concern over potential unauthorized access and data breach how can the organization effectively mitigate this risk ensure only compliant and authorized devices gain network access option a implement comprehensive nac solution to enforce security policy by verifying the compliance of device before we allowing network access now what is nac here now let's say example we have a device 1 we have a device 2 and we have a device 3 and this is basically your enterprise this is basically your enterprise so any so here we have a solution which is called as a nac network access control in microsoft it is called as np so any device can trying to connect nac will basically scan the system and check his health profile now health profile mean antivirus should be updated proper patches to be there blah 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 if it basically meet the baseline then only dhcp he is basically instruct and dhcp assign the ip and he will access the corporate network otherwise it will be part of a restricted network so by nac we can basically ensure only authorized health check device will be part of a network So option B increase so implement the company's NAC enforce security policy verifying compliance of device before allowing the network access which makes sense. Option B increase the frequency of network audit to identify non compliant device. It it prone to a lot of errors actually. Actually this is useful but network audits are reactive rather than proactive. So identifying non compliant device only after they have have access the network. So that is there. option c implement vlan segmentation to limit access and isolate potential breaches to specific area of network which is also true but vlan it can help to mitigate the impact of a breach by containing it or containing it within a specific segment of network but it does not prevent non compliant device from connecting to the network enhance endpoint security measures such as antivirus anti malware software and all the devices again enhancing the endpoint security measure provide a layer of defense against malware not a compliant so that is why the answer is basically b for beta okay b for beta let's move to the next question thank you <clears throat> a multinational corporation is seeking to streamline its remote access solution for employ around the globe the company want to reduce administrative burden you can see administrative burden of managing a vpn client software and minimize investment in special client hardware the ideal solution should provide a secure access primarily to web enabled applications and require minimal configuration on the user part given this requirement which vpn technology would best meet the company need option a implement ssl vpn actually yes because you just open a browser and type the ip and you can connect so it doesn't require any special hardware configuration we don't need to train on something so implementing ssl vpn 
required only standard web browser for securing access to web enable application option b deploy ipsec vpn see ipsec vpn offer robust security but are more complex in terms of client software installation management which could also increase the administrative burden rather than reduce it c is utilize a direct access vpn see direct access is an excellent solution for a continuous connectivity but it is limited to the certain window version and it required significant server side and host side configuration d configure l2tp ipsec again it required client software that basically maintain all the things so best answer is basically implement ssl vpn so ssl vpn is like a web based connections that you basically create without installing any special configurations and all that okay so let's move to the next coffee shot thank you <clears throat> another important interesting question as a security manager for a multinational corporation, you are tasked with enhancing the security and scalability of company authentication system. The cur company current setup utilizes Radius and TechAS, which are presenting a multiple security and operation challenges. Given the need for a protocol that offer the greater security feature, scalability and flexibility, which of the following would you recommend as a best solution? Option A, continue with the radius, optimize configuration to address the current security limitation. In my previous video, previous question, I already discussed that. This is option suggests sticking with the current system while optimizing might address some issues. So radius inherently lack the capability. Option B, transition to diameter, which provide enhanced security feature, which is true. Okay, because diameter is specifically designed to overcome the limitation of radius and TACAS. It also offer advanced security capability, improve scalability and better session handling. Option C is upgrade to a more recent version of TechAS to improve the security functionality. TechAS Plus is there, no doubt in that. Okay, no doubt in that, but it does not inherently provide the comprehensive benefit of diameter in terms of scalability flexibility because TechAS Plus come from a Cisco proprietary. Option D is implement a hybrid approach using both Radius and TechAS. Actually, Radius and TechAS both have a same concerns. To diversify the security operation resilience so only option which is basically makes sense is called as a b see you can see the summary here see first we have a radius diameter and tacas radius is basically use udp 1812 1813 where the diameter use sctp 3868 then we have a tacas plus so first we introduce a tacas which has a same feature radius then radius address that issue but Radius has their issue that that's why we introduced TechAS Plus, but it was Cisco proprietary. So we're looking for an alternate of a Radius, which is a diameter. So Radius does authentication, authorization, accounting. Diameter also does the same. TechAS Plus also does the same. But only thing is that in Radius, it is default enabled. TechAS and diameter, we have to customize. Radius is UDP. Diameter is TCP. TCP. It encrypt only password, encrypt entire payload, encrypt the entire session. Extension is limited user attribute, highly extensible, highly customizable. Interoperability is there, designed to replace Radius, but Cisco proprietary limited support outside of Cisco device. Failover is basic, failover is advanced. So from all point of view, diameter is basically as an open source, is the best alternate of the Radius. So let's move to the next coffee shot. Thank you. <clears throat> okay a security manager for large corporation okay as a security manager large corporation you are confronted with increasing incident of email domain spoofing okay which are compromising the integrity of the company communication and potentially exposing sensitive information Organization requires an effective solution to verify the authenticity of the sender domain name or domain during an email transmission. Which of the following option would best address this security challenge? Option A, implement the DKIM. See, DKIM is the most direct answer because question document, someone is doing a domain spoofing. Now, we have a two things. One is called DKIM, implement the DKIM. Option B, SPF. Option C, utilize DMARC policy to enhance the protection. And option D, increasing email server security by implementing more rigorous access control encryption of email at rest. But that is more from a confidentiality. Here the concern is we want to verify the authenticity of the sender domain. So let's take example. This is basically my domain. And this is basically the another domain. So let's take a hypothetical scenario. <clears throat> 
let's take a hypothetical scenario that uh, this domain is basically called as a kk.com and this domain is basically called as a nk.com so what happened is user when he's sending an email okay he's sending an email to kk.com okay so user basically using a kk.com to send an email so if this domain is configured with smtp relay so any domain email i can send from this particular domain okay but i want to give an authenticity that mail is actually came from kk.com so when mail is going through kk.com they they basically sign that particular email okay with the help of public key and then it's sent to the receiver receiver maintaining a public key of the known dns server so they verify the signatures with the public key if it's verified the mail is delivered in the inbox so dkm is basically the direct answer which is specifically address the issue of verifying the sender domain to prevent email spoofing and also it will basically give a receiving email server to check that email claiming to have a same or have come from a specific domain which was indeed authorized by the owner of the domain if you see the option b deploy spf spf is actually aim at preventing email spoofing by work by verifying the ip address of the server it means within a domain there is a server is there which is authorized to send an email so email otherwise anyone can configure the email server and he can say he is a server so we have to configure this is the authorized server to send an email so that is called as a spf dmark basically check the policy for spf and dkim and d does not make sense because d is talking about the confidentiality so in this case answer is basically a for alpha let's understand with the concept now here you can see the snacks what we have spf help you to prevent email spoofing by allowing the receiving emails to verify the incoming mail from a domain and it is sent from a host authorized that domain administrator so sp primary verify the source ip address of the email it mean in gmail.com we can have a multiple server hacker can also configure one server to send an email so we may have to make sure that these are the only authorized ip to send an email on the other side dkim ensure the integrity and authenticity of the content of email so whenever the mail goes it is signed by the email by the do domain owner so where the public key place in the dns to allow the recipient to verify the signature so dkim is particularly effective against the tampering and affirm that email has not been altered since it was sent so summary is basically here is that if the question intent is to uh, sorry if the question is basically has a intent to focus on verifying the origin of email strictly in terms of only ip address then answer is spf okay if the question aim to address the authenticity and integrity of the email content okay and domain then dkm would be the appropriate okay so here is a reframe version of query to clarify the spf is a desire answer due to the specific functionality not understood let's understand with the question so you get a better visibility <clears throat> So if you basically see the statement here the security manager at medium size financial services firm is concerned with about rise in a email spoofing attack which threatened to undermine the firm reputation security firm seeking to solution that effectively verify legitimacy of incoming email source not domain email source which of the following option would best achieve this go by validating the origin of incoming email again if you go by spf definitely spf basically have a record deploy dkim it is for the domain key authentication email filtering use of monitoring spam and user training program is only help you to guide the behavior of people so answer is basically because we specifically talking validating the sender email and all that that's the reason answer is a for alpha okay let's move to the next coffee shot which is the last coffee shot a multinational corporation is experiencing an increase in a virus attack which are causing a significant operational disruptions and financial losses as a security manager you are evaluating enhancement to your network security architecture to better control and mitigate this risk 
Considering the substantial impact of malware, which of the following solution would best integrate into your network infrastructure to enhance the malware detection and prevention entry point? Now, keyword is that you are evaluating enhancement of network security architecture to better control mitigate risk and considering the impact of the malware, which of the following solution best mitigate into your network infrastructure to enhance malware detection and prevention and entry point. Okay. So option A, deploy anti-malware solution that integrate directly into email server. Ensure that all incoming outgoing email communications scan for threats. See, integrating, you know, while implementing anti-malware on the email server is effectively for email communication. It does not address other entry points like web traffic and all that. So A is eliminate. B say install advanced anti-malware software on all the endpoints device to provide decentralized control and immediate response to detect threats. See, B also makes sense, but installing an anti-malware on all the endpoint provides the layer of protection, but it relies heavily on the assumption that endpoint defense will catch all the threat, which can be bypassed if malware spread from network vulnerability and operation issues and cost is also high. Option C, integrate the scanning software into organization firewall to inspect and filter out malicious traffic before it penetrate deeper into the network, which is true. This is the best answer because as it plays the malware scanning directly at the network perimeter, you can provide the centralized and comprehensive approach and D say implement the ideas that focuses on identifying potential malware activity based on the known signature and unusual network behavior. While ideas is crucial for detecting a potential threat, no doubt in that, but it generally reactive and better suited for identifying the intrusion attempts rather than preventing malware from entering the network. So that is the reason answer is basically C for Charlie. So do let me know how do you find this particular video. I really put my effort because it took me around eight to nine hours to record and edit and ultimate goal is to create a value. So if you find this video useful, do share your suggestion comments, how to improve the video and do share in network and how this video basically help you to pass this exam. Okay. Thank you so much. Good day. Bye.